What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel into another episode of the Overwatch League offseason recap. This week was rather dry, that is until the weekend came around as it gave us a lot of new information. A bunch of rumors and leaks also came out, but I really don't like reporting on that stuff unless I know it's official, so we're going to leave that out. A few noteworthy events still happen though, so let's get down to business. And yet again, we start off one of these episodes with the Dallas Fuel. Sorry if you're tired of me reporting on these guys right off the bat, but they're the ones who keep making the big moves. This time around, they addressed the main tank position, and they did so in a major way by acquiring Fearless in a trade with the Shanghai Dragons. Dallas literally just snagged a top three main tank from season three for money and money alone. Given the crazy moves they've already made, I was kind of expecting Dallas to only get decent picks at the two remaining holes in their lineup, aka main tank and main support. So the fact that they got another superstar as part of their ranks is rather impressive. The potential of this team continues to rise by the week. If they prove to have good synergy, Fearless and Hanbid could very well be in contention for the best tank line in the Overwatch League. If Fearless and Hanbin can play the way they did last year, then I don't see why it couldn't be a possibility. Another cool thing about the Fearless pickup is that he too was a former Element Mystic player. Besides adding another alumni to their roster, it's worth noting that he joined Element Mystic at the exact same time as Spark Sparkle and Rush back in the day, so he goes a long way back with those guys. Knowing that he already has some previous synergy and experience working with a couple of people on his new team is a great start. I commend Dallas for getting another crazy talented player during the offseason. They truly are going all out right now. All that's left is a main support and maybe another DPS pickup, and we'll be able to properly judge how good this team can be. But of course, we can't forget about Shanghai in this situation. I kind of feel like this is a surprising move. Fearless already had his contract running through 2021, I believe, and you'd have to imagine that the amount he was getting paid was pretty manageable. And I mean, like I already said, he was easily a top tier main tank in 2020. It's not really up for debate. So them just trading him away all of a sudden is kind of strange. I doubt they think that stand one is the answer. I guess they could have traded him to free up some cap space, but I don't feel like this is the case at all. If anything, they have their eyes set on somebody else. Now, if you're a Shanghai fan, you're probably saying, who on earth could possibly be able to replace Fearless? Well, it's important to remember who is coaching this team. Coach Moon loves fate. He supposedly tried to make a trade for him last year, but the mayhem wouldn't budge. But now it's a new season, and Florida might be ready to move on. If they have their eyes on somebody else, they might be more willing to trade him away now. It almost feels like Shanghai would not have traded away Fearless unless they knew Florida got a new main tank. Coach Moon would do anything to get his hands on fate, so this feels like it's highly probable, and that's what the rumors have stated as well, although nothing is confirmed as of right now from what I can tell. From the pure skill perspective, this would of course be a downgrade. However, fate did play the best Overwatch of his career under Coach Moon arguably back in 2018 on the Valiant, so maybe it wouldn't be that bad. But who knows? Maybe the Dragons have somebody else in mind. Let me know what you're thinking down in the comments section, Shanghai fans. It's totally understandable if you're upset right now, I totally get it, but I'd love to know who you think the Dragons will sign at main tank now that Fearless is gone. And what about you, Dallas fans? I'm sure you guys are overjoyed right now because the rich keep on getting richer. But this wasn't the only team that made a major signing at the main tank position as the LA Gladiators came out and they won the Muse sweepstakes. Muse is a rookie main tank player coming into the league this year. He played for the Paris Eternal Academy as a Korean player player, which was a little interesting, but he killed it. A lot of people will tell you he was the next best available main tank player coming out of contenders besides Mag. He's another one of those high potential types of main tank players who was especially known for his Reinhardt back in the day, I believe. I haven't watched a bunch of him, but a lot of people tell me that he is something special or that he at least has the potential to become something special. And he gets to play with space of all people, so that could be a pretty sick tank line. I don't know if it's like Fearless and Hanbin level, but but it could still be pretty darn good. I just hope that the Gladiators don't do the same thing that they did with Roar. I really hope that they can develop Muse the right way and he doesn't end up becoming a total bust. It would be a shame if the Gladiators waste the potential of a second main tank. From the looks of it, the Gladiators are building a solid team from top to bottom, so I'm not too concerned about the support that Muse is going to get from the in-game perspective. It's more about how the coaches do with him. The coaching plus his own personal motivation are the only two things that could be standing in Muse's way, and if he can overcome 
overcome those two things, then I have no doubt in my mind that he could be a top tier Overwatch League player. Seeing how he develops over the next year or so is going to be a very interesting storyline, and I'm very, very intrigued to see how him and the Gladiators can perform in 2021. In terms of other signings, the Toronto Defiant made their first move under KDG by bringing Beast back after initially releasing him just a few weeks prior. Some people are going to say this was kind of silly because he really wasn't that good in 2020, and while that is fair, I'm more so confused over the fact that they released him for like two weeks just to bring him back. I really don't hate this move at all, to be honest. I'm just confused. What was the point? Was it supposed to be a bait, or did Toronto genuinely have a change of heart all of a sudden? Supposedly, he performed quite well in scrims and in tryouts or whatever it was, so maybe Toronto still thinks they can get value out of him. Beast seriously does have potential as a player. If he can improve how vocal he is, as well as his Reinhardt and Arissa, then who knows what could happen. After all, he does have access to much better coaching this year. KDG might be able to transform him into a respectable player. We've already seen him help develop Marvel back in 2019, and I guess Sato to a small extent this year, and you never know who might get paired up with him. The common theory is that Toronto may be trying to get a Fusion University tank line reunion going with Beast and Bernard. That could be pretty nasty, it has potential. Toronto might be cooking something up here. They officially have my attention. While I'm on the topic of Toronto, let's briefly talk about their former player, Nevix. On Saturday, he announced he's taking a break from Pro Overwatch. He did not officially retire or anything, though. He's just going inactive for a bit to clear his head. His twit longer was quite insightful. It's a great read. He talked about how he came into this year feeling confident and how it quickly disappeared because he was very stressed out. And the stress came from a variety of factors, like his coach suddenly leaving and the team not really clicking in the ways he hoped they would. It gives you a good idea about some of the internal issues that Toronto faced on a regular basis and how it was very discouraging to deal with as a player. I hope that Nevix can come back someday. He really is a great guy and he deserves success. It really sucks because he's not even a bad player or anything like that. The competition at off tank just happens to be very, very stacked, so he ends up near the bottom of most tier list. It's a shame. Hopefully he can return one day. But Nevix was not the only former Toronto player to announce his break from the Overwatch League. Surefor also joined in. With him in particular, it's not really a surprise. He didn't suddenly vanish from Toronto's lineup for no reason, you know? He genuinely did feel burnt out, and he wasn't in the greatest mindset. Besides him straight up saying it, you could just tell by watching his streams, which included a lot of variety and not much Overwatch. It's sad to know he's going to be taking a break this year. He's been part of the pro scene since the beginning, really. He's a fan favorite, so not having him in the Overwatch League is going to be a little weird. But hey, at least he hasn't officially retired, kind of like with Nevix. Now, of course, that could change during his time off, but I'm going to remain optimistic. Maybe his urge to compete will come back after taking some time off. Best of luck to Surefor with his streams. A lot of people enjoy watching him play games, and now they might like him even more because he'll be in a better state of mind. Moving onward, we've got a few players getting released or leaving their teams. First is going to be Ark, who is retiring from the Overwatch League as a player. Ark was a pretty average player outside of his mercy, so the justice not bringing him back makes a lot of sense. The problem has always been his passiveness, I feel like. He likes to play way back, and it usually led to him being ineffective, sadly. The justice could easily find a much better replacement personnel-wise. But even so... Ark made other contributions outside of his play that made him a valuable player to have within your org. He was a fantastic teammate and leader, and he's easily one of the most positive players to ever be in the Overwatch League. Ark always has a smile on his face, and you can tell that people just love to be around him. Ark really is awesome. From his NYXL days until now, it's been a pleasure to have this guy as part of the league, because he's a class act. I know he's going to kill it in whatever comes next in his life. Next up on the departure list is Jerry. Not too much of a surprise with this one, because Jerry, while he wasn't bad, wasn't really anything out of the ordinary either. Jerry is quite replaceable. Not gonna lie though, it's so weird to see Boston hang on to somebody like Color Hex, but get rid of Jerry. But then again, it's Boston, so I can't really question it. But now the question we have to ask is, will somebody give Jerry another chance in the Overwatch League? He was by no means a bad player this year, and he might be able to become a better player if he gets the proper resources. Maybe Jerry gets picked up by a team who is either rebuilding or is going full-on budget mode. There's still might be hope for him. In other news, the NYXL officially announced the departure of Mondu. I talked about it a bit in my Mono to the Fusion video last Monday, but now it's official, so I thought I'd bring it up. I'm kind of disappointed in this decision. Mondu was a great talent coming out of O2 Blast, but he never really got a chance to shine. He could have been a part of this team's future, and I really don't know why the NYXL literally got rid of him, plus every other rookie they had. It's so silly to me. Mondu deserves another opportunity. Somebody please give this man a shot. 
Now for a few minor things. Unsurprisingly, the Toronto Defiant officially parted ways with their assistant coach and interim general manager, Al Bless. The Defiant hit the restart button this offseason and they mostly wanted everything gone. I think this especially goes for the coaching because people were already in and out before the season even ended. Sometimes starting fresh is for the best, so I really don't mind this. Now KDG also has the free will to pick and choose assistants that he is totally comfortable with. And finally, the Seoul Dynasty parted ways with Wizard Young who served as their strategic coach. Given how up and down the Dynasty War this year, this definitely makes sense. Some of Seoul's strategies and composition choices were questionable to say the least, and you'd have to assume that Wizard Young was at least partially responsible if Seoul booted him out, but not any of their other coaches so far. If I'm going to be honest, this might be it for the quote-unquote typical genius. He's looking for a team for the third year in a row. He no longer gets that same praise or respect he got in Season 1. We're long past that. The only reason I can think of that somebody might be willing to give him another chance is because he was technically part of a team that made it to the Grand Finals. That might give some teams hope that he could be worth something still. What type of role could he even play though? That's pretty up in the air. But I suppose there is a chance still that he could find a new home, even if the odds look grim. And with that being said, that's going to wrap up this episode of the Overwatch League offseason recap. If you enjoyed it, it would mean a lot to me if you could give this video a like and subscribe to my channel if you want to stay up to date with all things Overwatch League offseason season news related. You can also become a channel member, follow my Twitter, and join my Discord if you wish to further support me. And as always, thanks so much for watching, I really do appreciate it, and until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.